Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Monday Morning Message. So, um, <laughs> you know, moments like this are are unique for me because um, I love God's Word and I love God's people. But yet, you know, I, I have a, a hard time sometimes with social media, not not for any particular reason, but I, I just never want to be one to to get on to be heard or to be seen. I always want it to I always want it to have purpose, always. And I always want it to be something that God is is doing and not anything that um creates status, popularity, or any, mm, I just, I don't like that. It has always been for me about ministry and being able to use whatever platform to share God's word with people who are hurting. That's become a major, major passion and purpose for me. And 1111 has always been a very significant number in my life. I'm sure for many of you, 333 has always been significant. 555 have, has always been, it, it, it amazes me, which is why I, I moved it to 1111 this morning. And a part of what I do on Monday mornings, as often as I can, is have a Monday morning message, a message of encouragement. And, you know, always just tried to do it at 11 o'clock. This morning as I was getting ready, even really debating, you know, Lord, do I, am I supposed to? And, and as I began to pray and pray about the subject matter and, Lord, what are, what are people going through? And I remember the Lord just spoke to me and he said, remember 11.11. And it just hit me because 1111 is just such a significant number. I don't really, I could go into like the Hebrew and, you know, do all the prophetic insight into it or the 333 or the 555, but it has always been, it, I cannot tell you, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one where, you know, you look at your phone and there's that number um, and you could be doing three different things, but then you look at your, and there it is. And there has to be some significance to it. And for me, it, it, there is. And so I decided, like, I just felt like the Lord was putting in my heart, don't do it at 11 o'clock, do it at 11, 11. There's nothing magical about it. But there is something very spiritual about it. And so as I was getting ready today, I, I just felt the Lord just speak to my heart about what people are going through. And I never want to get on. I never want to get on here and pretend like my life is perfect and things are just going great. Because my life isn't perfect and things aren't always going great. And today I, I felt a significance in my heart that people are just struggling with life change, um, fear, discouragement depression and those things are debilitating those things paralyze you in your journey in your life physically spiritually emotionally and sometimes we just don't know how to handle major changes or the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job. So things hit us from all kinds of, you know, from every direction. And if we're not careful on how we handle these things or how we battle these fears or how we battle that discouragement or how we battle that doubt, 
those are major, major things that we can carry throughout our life. Anxiety seems to be a really big thing now, and, it, and it, it's been, but I think COVID has just brought even a higher alertness because anxiety actually affects 40 million American adults, 18 and over. Literally, that is 18% of the population. And it costs the U.S. $42 billion every year. Probably even more so now, heightened by everything that's going on in our world. Fear leads to doubt. Doubt leads to, incur to discouragement. Discouragement can lead to depression. Depression is literally the leading cause of disability. Worldwide, it, it, the average age where people begin to battle depression is 33. So it, it, it comes on early. In life, and if we don't learn how to handle it, we literally can take it to the grave with us, or it can be the cause of why so many die prematurely. And so, the last few weeks in particular, the Lord has just been really just dealing with my heart about this very thing. And, you know, I can come and sit here on a Monday. Or even on a Sunday, you know, when you've done this for 38 years, there's a lot of material over the years. I never want to do that. I, I don't, I'm not that. I, I don't want to just go back and pull a message that I preached in 1993, because none of you heard it, maybe. I, I, want, I want God to speak to your heart and to mine. And this isn't always, it's just not. It's not for everybody. These Monday morning words of encouragement are not for everybody. Sunday morning isn't for everybody. I've always, especially the last nine years, I've just said to the Lord, I'll do it for the audience of one. If it's just one person who's battling alone or feels alone in the battle, Lord, I just want to be a voice of encouragement. I want to be the Good Samaritan that stops and just brings an encouraging word. Like Isaiah said, a word in season to those who are weary. I always think of that with Jesus and the woman of Samaria. How that word in season that God had God had that woman on his heart and that Jesus needed to go through Galilee. He needed. He needed to stop in Samaria and sit at Jacob's well to have a conversation with one woman who was an outcast. And yet that one conversation not only turns that woman's life upside down, it turns the city upside down. And he actually delays his departure because the need was so great in the city, all because of what this woman went out and did after he told her. And he introduced her to the life of worship and to the life of God as her father. That's where we find those famous verses in John 4. The importance of those who worship him, that God, God is seeking those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. And I just think about that, just, that, just that time that he spent with that one woman, a misfit, an outcast, that no one, none of the Jews would spend any time or his disciples, with her none. But yet Jesus needed to go there for her. 
And that's how I see pretty much my life. It isn't always about the masses or the crowd. Done that, been there, great. But it's the one. The one who just needs some hope. Because you're not alone in this. Trust me, you're not alone in this. And if God can use my life, especially if I'm facing a storm or in a storm or you're in a storm, often the way that the Lord encourages us encourages us is that when you're going through something, I really preached about it yesterday in particular, the importance of giving to others when you yourself are in need. And that doesn't mean that you, you know, you give them money. It just means that you give them time. You give them a word of encouragement. You, you give them patience or you, wh whatever it is, whatever the seed is that you sow, that will come back to you. And so for me, it's always that, you know, if I'm going through something, there has to be other people going through this. It can't that I'm just going through this by myself. And that's really why I do this, because I don't want anybody to face a battle alone. And it's just good when you feel like somebody's been through it, or that somebody is going through it, and there's empathy there. There isn't just sympathy, but there's empathy. And not only is there empathy, there's compassion. And so this morning, I just want to take a few moments and and maybe this will just be over the next couple of weeks because it is such a deep subject matter that if, if the Lord just, if that's his will, I will, I'll continue it next week because it's such a deep and vast, vast subject. It's a deep subject matter. And, and so how do you handle, how do you battle fear? How do you battle doubt? How do you battle when you're when you're in a in a in a season of discouragement? Because it is so important. Like we can we can look to the world and you know the the the, the, the secular aspect of it and psychology and and uh, listen, those are all good and therapy and but if we don't get back to the root of things. If we don't go, if we don't get into the word of God that is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword that divides between the soul, the spirit, the joints, and the marrow, then I think we're just revisiting things, right? It's just like a continual revisiting of the same issue. And that's why as much as, I mean, listen, I go to therapy, I think it is critical. I, I, but I, but beyond that, I have to go to God's Word because books on psychology, as wonderful as they are and as, as revealing as they are about our emotions, and listen, I follow, I am telling you, it is so important to understand the way that our soul thinks and operates. But if we don't get to the heart of a matter or the root issue of a matter, we can literally spend our life in therapy and never really get beyond the just the, the the psychological aspect of it and never get to the root of the issue it's it's when you place the axe to the root it's where you find freedom it isn't just dealing with surface things it's like when people pray you know they'll they'll pray and they'll say uh, you know lord i i uh, i i just come against this virus but if you don't come against the spirit of infirmity that is actually the spirit behind the symptom, then it's just, you know, one virus after another. And it doesn't have to be coronavirus. It can be any virus. But when you apply the word of God and you apply it accordingly and you address the spirit of infirmity that is behind all sickness, all disease, right? He was wounded for our transgressions, Isaiah 53 said. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and that by his stripes we are healed. So when we pray, 
it is important to pray specifics. It is important to, especially if we're mature in our faith. Um, and so they're, they're just, I think there's, a, a, again, when you, when you pray the word, right, it doesn't return void, Isaiah. It doesn't return void. It accomplishes the very thing it was sent to do. I mean, God honors, David said, God, you honor your word above your name. So to me, there is a there's power when we apply God's word to our life, and we begin to think differently. Right, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Solomon said. So so let's just just let's just open this up a little bit, and and I'm I'm not going to get too deep into it, and I want it hopefully just be more like a not a conversation because there's no dialogue it's not back and forth but just me sharing my heart with you about how do you battle fear i talk to people today and i'll talk to them this week and i as i have throughout 38 years of ministry who have battled fear for years years and now they're in their old, and they're still, they're in old, you know, they're, they're up in their years, and they're still battling the same fears that they battled when they were in their 20s or 30s. Or they battle doubt. Doubt is a huge thing. We don't talk enough about it. How do we battle that? Or discouragement. And so you look at God's word, and you see the truths that come out of it. How do we deal with anxiety? I mean, that's at an all-time high. Mental health issues at an all-time high. Suicide, depression, all these things have just been elevated because of what we're going through. Or the stresses in, your, in, in our homes, stresses in relationships, the, 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 the things that, that, like the changes, the, all the changes. I mean, you, could be in, you can be in business and... The business market is changing. And then how do, you, how do you handle that discouragement that what used to be isn't anymore? Or that you're looking for something, a whole new career, and you're up in your years. That's not easy. Anybody that says it is, isn't telling you the truth. So how do we, how do we battle these things? So it, it, please get your Bibles, if you will. It, it, please do. Or open them up on you know, an, uh, an app. And turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 15. And again, I'm not, I'm not here to preach. I'm not here to get into like a deep teaching. I just want it to be a sharing or a conversation, at least a one-way conversation for now. How do we help people that are battling anxiety? <laughs> the 40 million plus adults. How do we help people that are suffering with depression? Literally, that is completely, it's debilitating. That literally impacts so much of our world. So fear produces two things. Fear will produce fight. There's two responses to fear. Fight or flight. And actually, you can read that in Psalms 55, and you can sort of see, you know, the, there's David's cry in there. And there's a time to fight and a time for flight. But those are the initial two responses to fear. And I want you just to just grab a hold of that, because you'll see that actually played out in, in God's Word among the heroes of faith. Anytime we are in a prolonged battle, Fear, doubt, discouragement. Or it seems like we just, we get, we get through one battle where we rest for a moment and then we, we long, right? We long for rest when we have been in a battle. And that is so important. It is so important. It is so important that we not only address those things spiritually, but we also address those things physically. Because if you don't find time to rest physically, it impacts you emotionally and it impacts you spiritually. 
and you will make some of the worst decisions and choices of your life because you lack rest. And I'm going to show you that. It's actually biblical. But here's the problem. So we, we, we're in a battle, whether it's fear, doubt, discouragement. We find rest from that particular battle, and then here we are. We're right back in another one. My question is, what if the thing that we're actually trying to flee from, it isn't the thing we're battling. What if it's actually us? What if the real issue isn't the thing that's creating the fear, the, that's creating the doubt, creating the discouragement? What if the actual issue is we're trying to flee us? We're trying to flee ourselves. And this is where I think therapy does come in. I think this is where you do talk to somebody and get some help and try to undo those things that, that have been habitual patterns in your life that you just, it's a, it's a, it literally, it is a cycle a, and a recycling of the same issues throughout your life. There's a reason that Isaiah called him a wonderful counselor. He's a counselor. God is a counselor. So that's what I, that's why I love counselors. I, I have some therapists in my life that literally have been a tremendous, and continue to be. But ultimately, I go to Jesus who is a wonderful counselor. That's why in, in, even in sickness, he is the great physician. Yes, doctors, the medical world, thank God for first responders and nurses and doctors. Where would we be? But I, I can't place everything of my life just with, with that part of life, with you know, the medical world. I go to the great physician. I, I look at God's word to address something deeper than just the symptom. So in Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, Abram is addressing Abram is really going through a time in his life, and I want you, I'm just going to sort of read this to you, and I, I hope you have your Bibles and, and just a notepad. Just make some notes and then just, you know, some scripture, or just some things that you might, might, God might be speaking to you. Let me just pray before we do. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, you know how uncomfortable I am with all of this. I'd rather be on the ice playing hockey with a bunch of guys. But Lord, I know that you have called me for this. I know that this is your purpose in my life. More than a hobby, more than a game, more than a sport that I love. Lord, I love your word. I love your purpose. Lord, I love your people who need help. And so all I can do is draw them to you. Just point them in the direction of Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. When it's all said and done, Lord, I just want to hear you say to me, well done. Every battle will be worth it. Every scar will be worth it. Just to hear you say, well done. So, Father, I ask you to touch your precious people who, ta who today need you. They just need that word of encouragement. I pray that I can be that one today, or at least just one of the many ones today that come into their life and bring a word in season because they're weary. So Holy Spirit, would you please come? You are the great teacher of the church. No one can teach God's word like you. You are the illuminator. You are the spirit of truth. You are the spirit of grace. So I ask that grace and truth to come and to open our eyes and to open our ears and to set us free from fear, from doubt, from discouragement. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. 
touch your precious people today. Help us to lean on you. Help us to trust you with everything. Everything. Lord, we give you everything. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word that you said, not one daughter tittle. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot, one tittle, one comma, one period to be removed. So, Lord, I pray that as we open your word, would you just speak to our hearts through those examples that you gave us in Paul, in David, in Moses, in Abraham, in Jeremiah, in Gideon, in Elijah, in Ruth, in Naomi. Lord, would you just use their life as an example to us? I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for this privilege. As uncomfortable as I am, just use it for your glory, I pray. Amen. So Genesis chapter 15, I just appreciate you joining me, whether it's live or later, whenever you watch. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and I pray that it's a blessing to you. So Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, it says, after this, okay, so after this, like we'll read that and go, okay, well, after this, after what? This is where I think we've got to get where we get hungrier for the word of God and just rather than just reading those words after this, after what? Because those are very important words in what we're about to read the rest of. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, listen to this, what can you give me uh, since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. The word of the Lord came to him. Listen to these words. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, you shall have, so shall your offspring be. Abram so good. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. So much, so much, so much in this. And this is, I pray the Lord will just allow me for the next week to just continue this with you. There is so much here. Okay, so let's just begin. Uh, let's just address this. Okay, so he says, after this, after what? How do we battle fear, doubt, discouragement? You can look throughout Scripture and see that over 350 times, some have said it's 365, one for every day. But it is the most repeated phrase in Scripture. It is the most repeated phrase in Scripture, do not be afraid. In some variation, in some form, it is mentioned over 350 times. Because, so God said it to Gideon when he called him to lead Israel. That's in Judges chapter 6. God said it to Jeremiah when he called him to be a prophet to the nations. That's in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus said it to the women, to the women at, at his resurrection. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, uh, then Jesus told his disciples, literally he says to his disciples in Matthew 6 verse 25, he says, do not worry about what you will eat. You guys know this, right? You will, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. 
And then you look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, and he says, Paul says, be anxious for nothing. I mean, that's a strong thing to say when so many of us are dealing with anxiety. But yet, the word says, do, be anxious for nothing. Well, I'd love to get to that point, but I'm not there. And so, so let's address this thing called fear. And, and you, again, again, let's go back to it, it, verse 1, after this. So what was the after this that, that Abram was afraid and you have, you'll see that in chapter 14 as to the possibility of one of the things that he was actually afraid of and why God literally came to him and said, do not be afraid. So, but let's go back before Abram. It was never God's will for mankind to be fearful. Fear was initiated in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam committed sin, a new word came into his vocabulary when he said, I was afraid, he's telling God, I was afraid, so I hid. So when sin entered into the world, now mankind struggles with fear. And so in speaking to God, Adam says, I was afraid, so I hid. So now mankind has this battle called fear. We struggle with fear about the past. We struggle with fear in this present moment. We struggle with fear, which is the number one fear that people actually have, the number one phobia, is the fear of the future. We battle anxiety, we have anxiety disorders, we have phobias. So when you think of the amount of fears that the world today battles, you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and go, that's where it started. Again, I, I think about Jeremiah 29, 11. Let, Let's just go there for a second because I love this so much. It, I know, it, it. well, it is actually... The, the, the number one uh, most famous um, verse in the Bible, Jeremiah chapter 29. But I, I want you to see something here. And, and this is so cool because, you know, we, we, we read it so flippantly and then there's something sometimes that just God wants to tell us in it. And so Jeremiah 29 verse 11, he says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Listen to this. They're thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. The NIV says to give you a hope and a future. You know what I love about that? I so love this because he says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. I'm saying it again for a reason. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, they're thoughts of peace and not evil. Notice this. He says to give you a future or to give you a hope and a future. Did you notice that he never mentions past? God in that verse never mentions anything about the past. So everything about God's thought life about concerning us is to give you a future and a hope, to give you a hope and a future. And so when we, when we battle these, these, we struggle with fear, we struggle, we struggle with fears from the, like the fear of the past or the, the present or the future. So fear is natural to man even though it actually was never God's will for us to be afraid. So when, when I'm battling fear, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, perfect love casts out fear. This is so important. Perfect love casts out fear. He says, he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Brilliant, profound. So a part of this battle for us is that every time we face fears is to know that perfect love casts out fear. He who fears has, listen to this, he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So for those of us 
who know God, who are born again, this is a strong statement, we have experienced a love that when perfected in us can wipe away all our fears. And the truth is, fear is not only common to people in general outside the church world, it is very common for us believers. Again, you, when I think about people who really battled fear, Elijah, Abram, David, Jeremiah, Gideon. So let's look at Elijah for a moment. And then I'm going to sort of take that Genesis 15 and we'll just start oh, maybe today and next week. But, but I want you to understand that fear isn't just common to the unbeliever or to people in general, fear is very much a part of the struggle we have as believers. And yet I read, perfect love casts out fear. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. So that is a major point because anytime you and I are battling fear, our tendency isn't to run to God, but to run from God. So look at Elijah. So in, in 1 Kings 18, he has this amazing encounter with God and the prophets of Baal. And so after calling down fire from heaven and having the priests of, of, of Baal put to death, in 1 Kings 19, Elijah runs out of fear as Jezebel had threatened to kill him. So here's a man that literally just encountered where he visibly saw the fire of God consume a sacrifice. And yet in the very next moment from this, from this great victory, he is fleeing, right? Remember the two responses to fear, fight or flight. And he runs afraid from Jezebel and Ahab. Or how about let's the disciples of Jesus? After Jesus is crucified, they they flee in fear and they're hiding in homes. This is a part of why God's word admonishes us over and over, over 350 times, not to be afraid, not to be anxious, because we are all going to battle fear one way or another in some circumstance of our life. And it's how we battle it, right? That's the key to me. It's how do we battle that fear? So what are some of the consequences, right? What are some of the consequences to living in fear? The, all biblical. Fear will often result in depression. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 21 says, anxiety in the heart of man brings depression. Anxiety in the heart of man brings depression. So fear often will result in depression. Fear or anxiety will often will lead us into sin. Example, when Abram, you remember when Abraham, not Abram, when Abraham, now the, right, God had breathed life into him and he went from Abram to Abraham. He lies about his wife because he was afraid that the Egyptians would kill him and take her. So he literally lies twice. Fear or anxiety will often lead us into sin. It's so funny because we want to highlight all the big things, right? All the big sins of, of, of whether it's people or we want to point the finger. 
but yet the very ones pointing fingers are living their life fearful. So, you know, it is easy to point our fingers at everybody else, but yet our entire life is operating in fear. Even in doing that, it's because we're afraid. So we will, we will always point out other people's skeletons because as long as we're projecting and, and distracting and telling, telling people about everybody else's sin, we're hoping that they won't see the skeletons in our, in our closets, which are far more than the skeletons of the people that we're judging. So fear is a major way of, like where people, again, just, it's easy, right? It's easy to, oh yeah, well look what they did and they should have never done, but, but you yourself are full of fear and you're not even addressing that. But that's actually even more crippling than the sin that we're pointing out about other people. Proverbs 29, because here's what happens. Fear will literally immobilize your spiritual life. I want to say that again. If we don't learn how to battle fear, that fear will paralyze your spiritual life. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the man, the fear of man, listen, the fear of man will prove to be a snare. Think about that. So when a person gets caught in a trap, when, when, when hunters put out snares or traps, they do that so that the animal doesn't move. And so a part of that for you and I is realizing that fear, when you're caught in a snare, you can no longer move. That's why the enemy loves to use fear as a snare. God wants us to walk in faith. The enemy wants us to walk in fear. And so a lot of believers are no longer spiritual. They're really, I mean, they're, they're not even progressing spiritually. They're not growing. They're not maturing spiritually because they're afraid of what people think, what people might say, what people have said, or what people can do to them, so fear will literally immobilize your spiritual life, your spiritual movement. Another thing that fear does is that fear will also make God's word unproductive. Literally, the traditions of man make the word of God to no effect. Biblical. Fear literally will paralyze, not only does it paralyze us, but it actually makes God's word, literally where the word of God is, is not even productive in our lives. Listen to Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. In the describing of the thorny ground, Jesus said, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke. They choke, they choke it, they choke the word, making it unfruitful. I don't understand why people don't turn to God's word more so than other things. Like I think Brene Brown is great. I think all these, you know, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of great voices. But if that's the, if those are the only voices we're leaning on and not leaning on God's word, again, it's God's word that doesn't return void. We need something to literally shift us internally. And that to me will always be God's word. I, again, I love all these brilliant minds. There's a reason why they're as popular as they are or famous as they are or because there's so much wisdom in them. But I recognize too that that wisdom that's in them comes from God. So why not just go directly to the source and let those voices encourage but never let them be the reason for my encouragement. My encouragement comes from God's word. Because that's where I can stake my life. So, for many believers, for many Christians, God's word is no longer alive to them because instead of walking by faith, now we're walking, you know, we walk in worry, we walk in fear. Therefore, God's word is choked and produces no fruit in our life. There's the thorny ground. And 
because of all that, we can see why our enemy works so hard, why the enemy works so hard to bring fear into your life, into my life, because it can severely handicap us from doing God's will. I want you to hear that. The ultimate goal that the enemy employs fear for is so that you will not fulfill God's will for your life. And that is, and again, it is through fear that Satan rules the hearts of many men. It's through fear. And when we allow fear to dominate our life, we are literally allowing the enemy to control us. All right, so I want, I got to wrap this up. I didn't realize the time. Man, I hope this is helping you. Okay, so what was Abraham afraid, or what was Abram, correctly, what was Abram afraid of in Genesis 15, where literally God says to him, in Genesis 15, he's attacked by fear. And we know he was afraid because God literally approaches him and says, do not be afraid, verse 1. And so God is not like us. He doesn't waste a lot of words. So he just comes directly and he says, do not be afraid. So we can be sure that the reason God said, do not be afraid, is because Abram was actually struggling with fear and discouragement. I'm sure, doubt. Because, so what was it exactly that, and, and I'm just going to do this quickly. So what was, it, what was it exactly that Abram was afraid of? Because in Genesis, so in Genesis, so it says, after this, right? After this, God comes and says, do not be afraid. After what? After Genesis 14. And in Genesis 14, and there's probably more things, but this is what at least I see from it, is that in Genesis 14, Abraham had defeated a coalition of four kings, and these four kings were in the east. And one of them was actually a very strong king. And he was the king of, of Elam. And, um, and, so, and so this, who had literally oppressed uh, five kings near the Dead Sea for 12 years. So you can think about this guy's power, right? For 12 years, he's oppressing these, these five kings all around the Dead Sea. And so, so this king of, of Elam or Elam, um, he had three alliances. And so, so, so including, by the way, the king of Sodom, the king, right? So the king of Sodom, which had, by the way, and ran off with Abraham's nephew, Lot. So Abraham comes with 318, note it, 318 trained men, along with two alliances, and now they, they literally go in and defeat the four kings of the east in a night attack. So they defeated these kings. They took all their spoils, including Lot. So it could be that, that Abraham fears the repercussion, the repercussions of that attack. These kings were dangerous, um, I'm sure retribution was a big part. Um, so, 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 so the scars, the effects of the battle scars literally impacted Abraham. Somehow, someway, because God comes to him in the next chapter and says, after this, after you've just defeated these kings and the fear of retribution because this guy was evil in this particular one king is evil who had oppressed several kings and kingdoms for 12 years. Now he may be coming after you. And so I'm sure one of those battles for Abraham was that fear of retribution. And so, by the way, at, at, at this point in, in, in his life, in Abraham's life, he, had, he, had be, he, he has become great. He had conquered armies, the armies of the East. And he's, he's I, mean, he, I mean, things are moving. Things are going forward. Things are going good for him. 
But the problem is that he still didn't have a son. So he conquers the, these kings and he conquers and he's got Lot back, but he still doesn't have a son. He still doesn't have an heir to his house, in his household. And so the potential of retribution and death was probably a major fear for Abraham because he's considering, where's my legacy? And, and how will God fulfill the promise that he told me, that he spoke to me about having sons and daughters that number more than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore? You see that, by the way, in verses 5 and 6. Or, uh, yeah, verses four, I'm sorry, verses 4 and 5. So when you think about this dialogue that's going on between, a, with, between God and Abram, there's some principles that we can actually learn that we can personally use in our life when we battle fear, doubt, discouragement, which then hopefully can help us be, and, and enable us to actually walk in peace and to walk in that perfect love that casts out fear. So, just for the sake of time, I want to be so very careful because I see the time. I don't want to go too long, and I've probably gone already too long. So, so if you will join me in this, and if this is really ministering to you, I'll do it more often. Just let me know. Or I'll just dig into it even more next week. So what are the secrets then to battle? I'm going to wrap this up right here. What are the secrets then to, to battling fear, doubt, discouragement? What can we actually learn about from Genesis chapter 15 on how to battle from that very dialogue that Abraham is having with God? And so let me just deal with this one. And this is just number one. To battle fear, doubt, discouragement, we must recognize the root of it. So it's so let's go back to verse 1. After this, we just saw what this is. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. This is so powerful. I am your shield, your very great reward. Again, recognizing the root we must recognize the root of fear and, and 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 a part of that is understanding that abram or abraham is probably afraid of ret retribution which is a physical attack right he's he's afraid of the the four kings coming at him and he's also considering his future he doesn't have a child and God shows up and speaks directly to the root of his fear by declaring that he is Abraham's shield and great reward. I love that. So Abraham didn't need to worry about protection or provision because God would take care of him. So maybe that is just the way to sort of wrap this thing up right here. God comes to him and he's afraid of the physical consequences, the retribution, the retaliation. And so he's afraid that they may just come and kill him. And now that the, pro the promise of God is now in jeopardy. He doesn't have an heir. He doesn't have a son. He doesn't have anyone to leave a legacy for or to. And God comes and he says to him, hey, Abram, don't be afraid. I am your shield. I am your protection. And I'm your very great, not just great. I am your very great reward. Abram, not only will I protect you, but I will provide for you. So one of the ways we battle fear is by being aware of the cause, the root cause of that fear. And there's so much more in this, and I definitely feel the stirring in my heart to continue it 
maybe not fully today, of, of course, because we've already come, we're all literally almost at an hour. And I want to try to stop at that hour. And that's, that's so long anyways. But thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for that time. So, fear, doubt, discouragement are often rooted in physical issues. So what are those what are what are these common fears or the roots of fear, discouragement, doubt? Often they're rooted in physical issues. Because Abram no doubt had just gotten and please please hear this and, and this is so important for you believers and for us as leaders and we're no we're no better we're just we just whatever it is we we this is what we do but i want to just speak to this and then i gotta stop abram had just come off of a spiritual and physical high i want you to hear this how physically this how how this physically impacts us and so he comes off this spiritual and physical high. He had literally just defeated the four kings of the east. And so he's riding this wave, right? This, this hyped up, mm, did it, wave. And he would, he would now, he, now he's gained a, a whole new level of respect from his neighbors, the Canaanites, because he had just seen God's miraculous provision in this 318 guys taking out, plus two allies, taking out these major kings. And so a common, please hear this, it sounds so simple, but if we would apply it, it could change the game for us. A common physical response to an emotional high is an emotional low. This is why for pastors, people that are used by God in that particular world, right? The church world, talk to any of them. We, we can hit a high and we come, I mean, we've just encountered whatever it is on that Sunday or on that whatever when we've spoken at a conference and we're on an emotional high. The next thing that happens is we're hit with an emotional low. The enemy will come in right after that emotional high and try to literally bring us so far down, even to the place where some pastors, some leaders, and I've battled it myself. My, the, the, my greatest, well, not my greatest, but where I am so cautious, it isn't when everything has happened and woo it is when it's all said and done and i'm in my car by myself or i'm i'm in a room i'm back at the hotel and it just starts it is in that moment where i have to remind myself and this is just what i do it's just what i do it's for my own sanity as soon as i'm done ministering as soon as I'm done, my next few moments are, Lord, none of this is attached to me. I give you all the glory for what you've done. I don't deserve to be there. I don't deserve to be the one speaking. Lord, it's all about you. I take all that responsibility off myself like as if I did anything because I'm always reminded of the words of Jesus. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a good word for us to remember, especially for those of us that are used by God in this particular way. So I want to encourage you. After you've hit an emotional high, that's when you have to be alert, aware that when we're running on an adrenaline, there's a there's a there's an adrenaline lift. The next step that hits us, it, it, I mean, there's a crash that comes right before 
like it's almost like this equilibrium like you're 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 on a real real high and then you just come down so hard and that's when that again it's just really how the the body chemistry works and 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 that's why like in sports like there's a there's an adrenaline rush right there's a high and then and then it's like it, you cave after that so i think that's a part of why I've, I'm, I'm right at an hour right now, so I'm gonna, I've got to stop. It is, it is probably no doubt the reason that Elijah struggled with fear. Remember, he has this emotional high. And then here comes a threat. <laughs> and he struggles with fear. He struggles with depression. And it actually, literally, a desire to die after he had just he just defeated Ahab and his prophets in 1 Kings 18 and so he he he, he ran in fear ask literally asking God to take his life but Elijah you just had an unbelievable victory so again just recognize it, it, his response doesn't make sense to us I mean, it just doesn't, because if he really wanted to die, why not just let Jezebel kill him instead of running away? That's why one of our responses to fear is flight. Rather than to stand and fight with God's word and God's promises, it is to run. And so many times it's the same for us, right? It's, it's that we've, we've, been, we've been running on this adrenaline and, and we're running on this adrenaline to meet deadlines and we're running on this adrenaline to keep, to, you know, to complete this and finish that. And then soon after that, we crash. When we crash is when we are open to irrational thoughts, fears, anxiety, discouragement. And so sometimes, this is going to sound too, too simple, but sometimes we just need to take a rest, eat some food, and just relax. So in order to battle fear, doubt, discouragement, we just need to know the root of it. And in some cases, the root of it is you need to chill. You just need to chill. It is normal that after you experience a high, as soon as you hit that mountaintop, there are no mountaintops without going through valleys. So you're going to hit a high, and then you may be hit with a low. And it's what you do when you're hit with that low. And in some cases, you can't just keep running on adrenaline. You just can't keep running on fumes. You need to stop. You need to pause. You need to listen. You need to eat well. You need to exercise. You just need to do things to take care of your physical body. That's a part of how you handle that. That's, how, that's exactly what God told Elijah. I mean, that's exactly what happened to him. Like, that's what he needed. And so again, just recognizing one of the roots of it is that it is root, it's actually rooted in physical issues. When you're exhausted, when you're so worn out, you don't have the ability to fight. So what do we do? We throw in the towel. So I pray that, that this, the beginning of this, at least in this, what, in my, what I'm sharing, that you take some time for yourself Self-stewardship, not self-care alone, self-stewardship. We need to become better stewards of our life because all of us have a set time on this, on this planet. At some point, you and I will see Jesus face to face, whether he returns or whether we exit this planet at a very specific time in life. Don't shortcut it by allowing the stresses of this life 
and the fears and the doubts and the discouragement to ruin your life, your thought life, your emotional life, your spiritual life. Because at the end of the day, Satan's job is one thing, to literally take you out. So there's one less purposeful being on the planet. And so that you will not fulfill God's purpose for your life. We operate in faith or we operate in fear. I pray that the Lord will just begin to set you free. That, that he would make you aware of the root issues. What was the after this? What is your after this? What have you just been through that the Lord is going to say to you, maybe through this, just this time together, after this, hey, don't be afraid. The Lord's saying to you, to me, hey, do not be afraid. I'm with you. I know what you've been through. Keep your eyes fixed up. And this is why I love that he, literally he came to him in a vision, right? So we go back to that ver the first verse. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And without a vision, people perish. People cast off restraint. Don't allow fear, doubt, discouragement to take your eyes off of the vision for your life. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for this privilege. Lord, I thank you for this honor. I don't deserve this. But because of your grace, I'm always reminded of Paul's words, I am that I am by the grace of God. And I pray, Father, that as your grace continues to shape and mold my life, Lord, I pray that your grace will be poured out upon us, upon your people today. Lord, especially those that are just battling fear and doubt and discouragement. Lord, I ask you to help us, teach us. Lord, you made us. You know how we're made up and what we're made up of. You know the way you wired us. So, Lord, I just ask you to help us not to just live off of these adrenaline rushes, but, Lord, how to just have that equilibrium, the, the balance of worship in spirit and worship in truth. That, Father, that we will just go beyond just the spiritual side of this, but let it impact the physical and the, and the emotional side of this. Father, I ask you, that your love would be poured out upon your people today. Those that are battling fear, God, I thank you that perfect love casts out fear. Lord, I thank you for what Paul said in Timothy, that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a disciplined mind. Lord, I pray for that love. I pray for that power. And I ask you, Lord, for a disciplined mind. Bless your people today. Bless your people today. And may they overcome every battle of fear, of doubt, and discouragement in the name of Jesus. May we see miracles today. Lord, may we experience those miracles in our own life this week. Because, because God has not given us the spirit of fear. So we will not allow that fear to dominate our life. Not physically, not emotionally, and certainly not spiritually. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen and amen. May I encourage you. Take time. And maybe just for a season of your life, fill your life with worship. And you'll see this, how it plays out and, you know, whatever, I, I come back to it. But worship is a major, major way of 
being in the presence of God and just filling your room, your car, just whether it's with your AirPods or just fill your heart and your mind with worship and just stay in that state of being of worship and watch how significant that worship impacts your life. So it's just not something we do on a Sunday or a Wednesday. It's actually a way of life for us. I love you guys. I pray that this has helped you, encouraged you, even in the smallest way. I just want to scatter seed that God would send a harvest to your life so that you can be free to live your life for him. I'll see you next week. Have a great week.